Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm really, really pleased today to have uh, Jonathan Meth. Jonathan is a dramaturg extraordinaire, a director, a curator, very involved in European theatre and disability arts. He's a lecturer at Goldsmiths. He's worked with many of the major theatre organisations in Britain, and he's a fascinating theatre thinker. Welcome. Um, ben, uh, thank you very much for that charming introduction. I'm not quite sure I can live up to all those epithets, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do my best. Lovely to see you. Yeah, great to see you. So we'll go straight in. Do you think Britain has produced relatively little European theatre over the last 20 years? And if so, why do you think that is? Well, it probably won't surprise you to know that dramaturgically I'm going to need to just spend a little bit of time with some of those terms. Um, because right. I, I need to kind of have a little, a little look at what we think we mean by European theatre. Um, and the reason why I do that is because I'm a huge Europeanist, um, kind of unapologetically, in the process, in fact, of renegotiating my own formal status um, uh, since the Austrians very kindly changed their laws last September enabling me to apply for dual citizenship. Previously, I was entitled to be Austrian, but I would have had to have stopped being British. But I quite like the possibility of being both Austrian and British. At the same time, I'm on the cusp of moving from London, the city I spent most of my life in, uh, to Florence in September, uh, because my wife, Debbie, has a new job there. Um, and so uh, the European question immediately uh, um, um, speaks to me um, in a very personal way for those reasons. But also because of the fence network, which I hope will come to later, um, I've got to know a little bit um, um, continental Europe, I'm going to call it, um, because of course we too here in Blighty are European as well, despite all those Brexit um, shenanigans. Um, but the reason really seriously why I want to interrogate European theatre is because I don't quite know what it means. Um, they don't make theatre in Romania in the same way that they make it in Ireland, in the same way that they make it in Portugal. Um, uh, and the idea that they would or should or could seems to me to be slightly far-fetched and not terribly helpful. And I wonder whether it's a kind of hegemonic hangover of the, of the tyranny of the English language and its, its, its sort of global supremacy that we still allow ourselves the kind of, in my view, intellectual laziness of this notion that there is European theatre. But let's stop berating the Brits for a moment and kind of go, maybe what we mean, do we, is a theatre that, that doesn't have the playwright at its centre. Is that what we mean? That isn't, that isn't uh, about the playwright as, as um, somehow uh, a, a, a semi-protected species. Uh, but actually is about the fact that theatre making uh, presents a different set of hierarchies or collaborative relations in different European countries. Uh, and because they don't share, with the exceptions of, of North and Cyprus and Ireland, an Anglophone uh, 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 impetus, shall we say, um, that they occupy a different space than we do. I, I'm much more sympathetic to that as a working definition um, but it's just this idea that we in Britain seem to think that Europe is somehow that place over there and that largely we can sort of refer to it as the same. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, some people might think, well, there seems to be a paucity or poverty in that. And I think it begins with the nomenclature and the thinking. Sure. So... I'm going to unpack a couple of things uh, there because that's already pretty deep for us. So one is this idea of the theatre where the playwright isn't at the centre. Uh, but I think there is also another idea of a simply, um, call it theatrical or dramatic work, made outside of Britain and which comes to Britain uh, in some form. Uh, and I hear people speak that both that type of work, actually from any country, so we could almost go globally or, or things, maybe there's been some more from uh, America or not. And sort of the question question of that, essentially, I guess you could call it foreign work. And then there is this uh, second question of uh, the work of playwright at the centre of not. So maybe you can have a 
I think about both of those things. Um, perhaps we can start with the one that you think is. Uh, so I get the impression that maybe you think that perhaps there has been more work where uh, the playwright isn't necessarily at the at the center. Collaborative work, um, other sort of work, or, or community work, uh, and perhaps it's a little bit unfair to say that that hasn't. And then maybe for work which wasn't necessarily produced uh, or originated uh, on sort of British soil, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I suppose uniquely among European countries, we have the West End. And the only analogue to the West End is Broadway. And so if we look at the major theatre producing uh, uh, um, countries outside of Britain, uh, the logical comparator is the German speaking countries. We make theatre for 100 million people across Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, um, with more money, more investment, a better infrastructure, and so on. Um, I make those observations, but partly because I think it's also important that we're aware of a sort of economic uh, 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 um, picture in all of this. But I do think it's partly um, our insularity with our language. Um, so I do think it is about non-English language originated work. And that because there is a simple equation in people's minds, well, of course, if you're not making work in the English language, then it's going to be work that doesn't centre language per se. And I would say that there's truth in all of that, but it's not the full story any more than the Royal Court story is the story of British theatre since, let's say, John Osborne in 1956. It's, it's a great story and it's a very important story, but it's only part of it. So a lot of it depends on where you look. And I think there's always been enough, another and indeed other traditions of theatre making in this country, they're very rich. But because of the way the structures of commentary and criticism work, which are fundamentally about, at least previously, the selling of newspapers. Uh, now I'm not quite sure that, 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 we've, that we've worked out what that looks like in a digital realm. But set that aside for a moment. You can see that there was a kind of hierarchy, first, second, third stream critic, uh, and, 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 that, and that the job of the critic was to communicate with the readership. And so to some degree, that starts to frame what we might or might not understand by theatre practice. Um, so I would say that, 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 that as a rich theatre culture, we have always attracted and generated very, very diverse theatre makers. Um, I don't think that that's, that's um, I don't think that that is on the wane. I think probably the opposite is true. I think that, that um, that, that there is a rich complexity of theatre being made in this country. Um, but I, I, I would like to imagine that we could talk to a different sort of discourse about how it does or does not speak to theatre made in the German-speaking world or in Romania or in the former Yugoslavia or in Portugal or anywhere else in Europe. Because I think also we might, we might challenge ourselves to know those theatre cultures a little better than we probably do. Yeah, that's really fascinating observation. In fact, interestingly, I was speaking to Rashid Dastadar, one of the leading British poets we have here, who are making similar observations about a poetry, not in English language. We, we don't read enough in translation, it doesn't come here, but that's only, again, to your point, part of the story, and that actually there has been a lot of other kind of arts happening if you, if you go and, and look for it. Uh, dwelling on that point for one moment before I think we'll come to the fence was I remember perhaps 10 or so over years ago, a very running uh, dialogue in the in the heyday of theatre blogging, I would say, between Chris Good and David Eldridge, uh, which is actually somewhat resolved uh, in the last year or two, which is quite interesting uh, on another podcast, but where Chris Good would talk about a lot, uh, I would say, the kind of collaborative, devised, very different way of, of making theatre from the playwright the centre and David Eldridge coming more from a playwright centric kind of viewpoint but interestingly when I was hearing the conversations in the margins in the commentary as we were talking about it particularly as a younger theatre maker doing some work in kind of both ways uh, in some ways I, I thought there was actually a lot more in common from what they were saying than, than perhaps that that separated them but that that dialogue has been going on for a very long time and and seen with those with two and, and you could see it uh, you could see it today um, do you think that's as, as lively debate today as it's kind of ever been between those kinds of different kinds of theatre making? 
think I think because we've had a year of of, of theatre um, online or not at all, largely. Um, I don't know where those debates are. Now. My sense of of the way in which the debate was was played out, let us say, in the nineties, when it was new work versus new writing, as a kind of shorthand. Um, my sense was always that that was about access to resources in the end and the perception or misperception uh, by one camp that the other were getting the toys and that they were not. Um, and, you know, that's why I'm always prone to mentioning economics within conversations around um, trends, nomenclature uh, um, and, and inter in interesting aspects of, of sexual development, because I think it's always lurking there and it needs to be mentioned. But in the end, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, for me, it was always a false dichotomy. Um, the playwright is, you know, is a right, a W-R-I-G-H-T. They're, they're a maker. Um, and, and whether they are the, the kind of the sole scribe uh, uh, romantically pictured in the attic on, on an old Olivetti typewriter, um, or whether they are in the rehearsal room making work collaboratively with other, other people in real time, in real space. Um, seems to me to be um, only modestly important in a kind of literary sense. But a lot of it's about the way in which we encode and enshrine things in things like legal or economic structures or in the way in which companies operate, rather than actually about the work or the way in which the work might work. Um, and I suspect, you know, that, that, that if a plurality of possibilities were encouraged systemically, as opposed to what I think often happens, which is, well, no, you do that thing in that way then, and they do that thing in that way then. Um, then I think we might begin to see the work for what it is, which is hopefully constantly cross-pollinating, cross-fertilizing, looking across, stealing, borrowing, interrogating. Yeah, I didn't come to understand that, for instance, the funding system in France uh, the Netherlands, Germany, very different from here and actually influencing the way we make work. And even, you know, America, obviously very different again. So maybe this is a good segue to to tell me about the fence, how it's come about, what it's doing, uh, how how that is. And actually, I, I guess it's kind of funded and come about from quite a different route as well. Yeah. So 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 the fence came about um, in part uh, uh, when I was director of uh, Writernet, which itself had grown out of New Fair Rights Trust, um, uh, and I was director of, of those organisations for about 15 years, from 1994 to the beginning of 2009, so a while ago. Um, and what I noticed, and in a way it speaks to what we've just been talking about, was that the playwriting culture however you wanted to see it in this country. Um, uh, in so far as it looked beyond these islands at all, and I talk about these islands because we are two islands, uh, and we would look to Ireland, very obviously, uh, 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 for that rich cultural tradition in terms of writing. But it, we would look to America, and occasionally to Australia, but very seldom would we look at anything that wasn't Anglophone. And I wondered about that and I thought, is this really good for us? Is this a way in which we enrich ourselves as a playwriting culture? Are we talking to the rest of Europe, let alone the rest of the world, other than in that kind of West End Broadway axis, with the exception of a few, you know, great playwrights like Ravenhill or Stevens, who would have been networked into the German speaking world by their agents because Probably there was an economic imperative to do so on the one hand, and also, you know, creative opportunities to work in different ways, which both of them as artists will have embraced, and that's all well documented. Um, and so I thought, well, well, what if we set up a European network of playwrights? And perhaps not just playwrights, but people that are interested in the playwright and prepared to encounter and engage with the playwrights, so maybe dramaturgs, translators, directors, producers, literary so on. And what if that network, I thought, was relationship focused rather than transaction focused? So not being market driven, which is please produce my play or will you read my script, but rather can I get to know you 
as a fellow artist? Can I get to find out a bit more about how things happen where you are? And perhaps, if you're interested, tell you a little bit about how things happen where I am. And could we do that in a multilateral way as a way of recognizing the kind of the, 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 the crouching hidden tiger in the room of colonialism? Uh, 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 so that in that kind of binary exchange, we weren't simply unconsciously replicating those colonial paradigms. Oh, this is how we do it. But rather, in a spirit of, of, of curiosity and interrogation, meeting with each other, encountering multiple different versions of how things may or may not happen. Um, and out of that, uh, 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 enabling, encouraging people to come up with their own ideas and their own forms, A, of collaboration, but also how they might then see themselves back home, perhaps in a slightly different way, having glimpsed other landscapes and other possibilities within them. So what is the fence up to today then? You've got some relationships and things going, and seems to be quite a lot of interesting work bubbling out. And, and I think this is sort of central to a lot of the work you do is actually centered on people, people and uh, relationships. Uh, so is there anything you want to comment on? And, and maybe this intersects with your move, uh, move to Italy coming up and, and, and being back in Europe. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, uh, we are still uh, planning, uh, uh, perhaps foolishly, uh, uh, on two network meetings happening next month. Uh, the first uh, um, in the second week of June uh, in Graz in Austria, uh, by coincidence, as part of Dramatik Rennen, um, uh, uh, a festival held uh, jointly between Schauspielhaus Graz and Unité, which is attached to the university there, um, and run by the redoubtable uh, Edith Draxe, uh, who's been a long time Fence member. Um, and um, the second being at La Charité Solar, a couple of hours south of Paris, as part of that uh, rather glorious small towns um, festival, uh, Les Quatre Coins du Mot, the four corners of the word. Um, uh, and we have no idea whether we'll be able to get there or not, because at the moment, of course, we can't, we're not allowed to. But we hope that in the intervening month, um, there will be some shifts in what is possible. And, and so those network meetings, like all network meetings, will have their own particular characters, uh, both in terms of the people that go to them and host them, but also in terms of how they function. So the Austrian one will very much be, here is a festival, come and participate, watch some work, be part of festival uh, uh, debates, uh, uh, encounter some playwrights, meet some new and young and emerging artists. Um, the French thing will be come and participate. Uh, 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 we're going to focus around the theme of bourlingue, uh, 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 which is a very particular concept, which is a little bit like um, um, sailing into choppy waters, but nonetheless going into those uncharted areas uh, and, and meeting them uh, with um, our full face to the wind uh, 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 in a kind of French way. And I still don't quite know what's, what that means in terms of what people will actually do, but there'll be a three afternoons where we will present to a, a festival going public, socially distanced, etc., cetera, um, around those things, either through practical workshops with them or in creative presentations to them. And I suppose those two little snapshots hopefully give you a quick idea of, of, of just the different qualities of, of fence network meetings that, that will sure. depend on local characteristics. Sounds amazing. And obviously I've been tracking it uh, over the years. And if people are interested, uh, can they reach out to have a conversation with you to be involved somehow? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because um, um, I'd like to be able to say yes, because of course one wants to be welcoming you can't have open, everyone in the world an invitation but you can't no and 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 although the network is informal um as much as it can be i mean post brexit we needed to move it to stockholm so we, we we've moved it to stockholm it's been headquartered there for the last three years and we have a board and we have a bank account there 
And so in the lightest possible way, we formalized it. Um, but in order to make sure that we don't flood it, for example, with bricks, um, I, I, I kind of have a sort of quota system, a tacit quota system where I kind of go no more than 20% brick. And so um, the, way, the way the fence develops, we started with 25 people, and it's now upwards of 250. A third of whom are really active, a third of whom are like lurk, um, and, and are happy lurking and want to continue lurking. And a third of, of whom really could care less and, and should be off the books. But because we kind of deliberately stay open, and wait for people to us to say, no, no, please, no more, Jonathan. I'm yeah. gone. Thank you. Um, um, and that there's a reason for that, because because um, it's relationship focused to come back to your observation of that is an important thing. I also wanted to do something that, that, that reflected the life cycle of people, where they go off and they change jobs, or they go and have kids, or they move countries, or they change, they change their circumstances. And that might mean, as has been the case, that various fence members, fence members have disappeared for five, even 10 years, but then come back because they found a different way to engage, a different um, proposition, a different need. And I wanted to remain open to that because everything else in our culture seems to me to be short term, focused on the transaction, the here and now and the immediate future. And I wanted to do something that was a little different, that had a different kind of quality, a different texture. And well, that was sort of open and, and flexible to that. But what that means is that is that the way it grows is through recommendations of specific people from within the network. And that I try to curate that growth by making sure that we don't have a sudden influx of one particular kind. We might pick up individuals along the way. We might notice gaps and we might be encouraging of filling those gaps. But certainly the Brits are well represented at the moment. And that's certainly something I... I know I've been more of a sort of lurker, but I've come in and out as actually as my own theatre and creative practice has also come in and out over the last 10 or 20 years. Like you say, children, challenges, jobs. And there, there is something nice to an informal uh, longevity. And I think it's sometimes I find it's a cousin relationship to the nature of friendship, like friendships can form. They can ebb and flow. They can break. In fact, broken friendships can be. Uh, I've now seen, sort of old enough to see that, that it can be more uh, uh, devastating than broken romantic relationships, which have a have a clearer arc, I guess, in our perception of what they should be and how they break up and how we move on. I mean, obviously, it can be very um, catastrophic as well. But we don't actually have those same arcs on, on friendship because they are greyer and looser and ebb and flow. But when they break, can actually be um, even more devastating and, and have doors or windows for for long relationships over time. Maybe this is quite a good segue back into perhaps uh, WriterNet because actually that's, I think, where we might have first met with some sort of interaction there. But that that's probably about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I guess my question there is, that was quite interesting because it had a life, right? It started, it did really great things uh, and then ended. Um, and I wonder what you felt about that. Maybe any learnings you had from that. In and in some ways, I think back now that it it lives on the memory um, in a, some ways at at a lower ebb than it was at the time. Like at the at the time, I think it was um, you know very very influential, and that influence perhaps hasn't lasted so much, at least in an obvious way, in, perhaps in a less obvious way, but maybe that was part of its purpose and point. So I'd be interested in your reflections on that. And obviously WriterNet has grown into these other things, as you've, as you've mentioned. Yes, I mean, I, I, um, the concrete legacy of WriterNet is, of course, the fence, because without WriterNet, um, um, it wouldn't have been born uh, or indeed incubated and developed in the first place. And having a formally constructed parent company, we were able to capitalize on two bits of European funding, um, A to birth it, B to incubate it, which meant that it, we were able to grow some very well founded and richly tendered comparatively foundation. And I think it was on that secure basis that we've been able to, to build and develop in the kind of um, casual and informal way that we have. 
So I think it's important to acknowledge that. But my intention was never that Writernet should, should be legacy focused. Um, it was always about what, what were the present needs and how, that, how might they be um, supported. Um, and that when we, when we knew we were, we were going to wind, uh, wind down and wind up, um, I was very much uh, uh, c committed to the notion that our task was to simply, as it were, exit stage left and leave a space. And that into that space would come something else um, that was for others to determine. Um, and, that, and that my job certainly was to not get in the way, simply. Um, and that a very good way of doing that was by having a single different legacy vehicle to preoccupy myself with. And therefore, that seemed to make sense to me. In terms of what it was, well, I think what it was, <coughs> if I include its, its antecedent New Playwrights Trust, founded by Susan Croft and then taken on further by Polly Thomas before I came to it with other, other important people like Ben Payne also along the way contributing, um, was a kind of 20, 20, 25 to 30 years uh, of... of um, grassroots support for a playwriting culture in what was already a playwriting rich, but rather narrow in the 80s in, in terms of, of, of what we might understand by diversity. Um, and I think we expanded, we helped to expand that base. We helped to create opportunities for more different people to access that. Um, um, but I was more, always more interested in the doing of that than in the shining on a light on it and going, oh, look what we've done, bit of that. And so I'm not, I'm not troubled by whether or not people remember New Playwrights Trust or writing it. We were part of a culture uh, that included all sorts of different animals. I mean, you know, Charles Hart was the new writing officer at the Arts Council England um, in the days when there were such things. Um, for, for long enough to make an impact because he was very committed from a policy point of view uh, to literary managers as being the structural device that would help to cement the place of the playwright and a new playwriting culture within this country. And if you look at the, uh, 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 the development and growth of playwriting in the 90s and the early noughties, you could see literary departments flourish. Now, if one takes a quick temperature test of the waters today, one can see that that model is no longer the model of choice because it's been left to a much more sort of Darwinian uh, uh, self-selection process. Um, some have stayed, some have not, some have fallen by the wayside. In those days, the very word dramaturg was not used. It wasn't, in my view, until Paul Syrett uh, left Soho to join the, RS the RSC and insisted that, that he uh, had the word dramaturg in his job title. Um, but we saw one of the major companies begin to embrace that as a thing. Um, and subsequently, one can perhaps see the sort of relative success of uh, dramaturgy and the concept of the dramaturg uh, and a move away from the literary department to some degree. Um, uh, but also we were part of a group of, of different regional organisations, some of whom had grown out of the trade union movement. Uh, one thinks of Northwest Playwrights in Manchester, for example, that was a theatre writers union initiated uh, uh, um, grouping that was very much grassroots, locally based, about promoting, about promoting them. Um, but I think what happened was, was that, was that a, a range of different ways of doing things um, came through in that period. And so in the same way that you had that organization at that time, and again, that will have lasted probably well into the late noughties, into the early teens, but mostly those kinds of organizations have gone now. You've still got New Writing North in Newcastle, and you've still got New Writing South in Brighton, but on the whole, they're much fewer and far between. And that might be a good thing because needs change, structures change, systems change, uh, obviously, a lot of those systems and structures predated the online world, predated the world of social media. Um, and you need things to change. They shouldn't be kind of an aspect in, in my view. And mm -hmm. so I was happy with the work that Writer and New Playwrights did. 
um, particularly in the world before the internet, around information, advice, and guidance, when that was a necessary and important contributor to enabling greater access and greater diversity to the playwriting picture. But also, also subsequently, um, in, in the days of the internet before the prominence of social media, um, uh, when the transfer of information, advice, and guidance opened up things. I think opening up things was what we were really about. So whether that was the four day, the four day um, kind of extended program that we did in 96, seven with Jack Bradley at the National Theatre Studio, where we invited around a hundred different theatre makers, either to give workshops in real time or to make presentations on how they did what they did. At that time, you didn't know what people's practice was because you didn't get into rehearsal rooms unless you were in their show. And there was a sort of mystique somehow around how people worked. And I think either in those live events or through the systematic organised presentation of information, advice and guidance online, which kind of we now take for granted because we can all get it in seconds on our phones, but in those days we couldn't. Um, there was a certain basic level value but you, can, you can't really trace that value. You can't really go and say, well, you know, 10 years on, do you remember getting that piece of information? Did it change your life? And you're kind of going, huh? It's very hard. You, you, you have a sense that you're hopefully just part of the kind of, you know, the fabric in a sense yeah. of, of, of the culture. And that as the fabric shifts and, and, and needs emerge that you... You, you shift and change a little bit with it. But at a certain time, it seems to me, it's absolutely fine to go, well, that was great, but now we're gone. And yeah. let's leave a space. Yeah, and I, a very important part of, of the ecosystem then. Um, that's interesting. I'm fascinating that history and legacy, which I think is maybe one of the things that, at least for me in British theatre, uh, maybe it's of every generation, but we, we don't have actually the, the, that same sense of our own sort of modern, quite modern theatre history just have just gone by in, in the last kind of five, ten years or in the five, ten years before, which I think is quite, quite interesting. And the, there's a lot of talk about Build Back Better. And I think a lot of people have talked about Build Back Better within, within theatre as well, with very many different uh, lenses. Uh, from your point of view, what, what do you think this might mean for uh, theatre and what might we do? I guess there's a this European lens, there's a kind of lens about the people who come into theatre, there's the economic lens, which actually now that you mentioned it a couple of times, I, I think is potentially under appreciated, but I'd be interested, you know, build back better, what what should we do? Can we do anything actually with it? And, and how are you thinking about it? So I, I suppose a thing I'd want I'd want to do is sort of go, well, before we do any building, um, can we have a little look at the landscape, please? Um, and, what, and, what, and what might our analysis of that landscape want to tell us? Well, well so far, I think what it tells us is that, is that the Arts Council says, well, we think we got this largely right in our response to the pandemic, um, says Nick Sorota uh, to government. Uh, in terms of spending your money, government, aka the taxpayer, well. Um, but perhaps our, our trickle-down thinking didn't really get as far with freelancers as it might have in an ideal world. But we are very convinced that, you know, without the built infrastructure, there is no work for freelancers, and therefore we were right to prioritise that. So I think that needs a little bit of, 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 of challenge, doesn't it? A little bit of unpicking and unpacking. And you sort of go, well, everything, if everything is geared towards the infrastructure, then to what extent has it, does it trickle down? And does it trickle through? And if you want to build back better, do you start with the brickwork and the masonry in your flagship institutions? Or do you have a different concept of what it is and how you might want to build at all? And so I would hope that that work might be done, and that work might, might need to involve perhaps looking in some different places. Because if you go back to the same builders merchants, you're probably going back to the same kind of building materials and the same kind of architecture and the same kind of way of thinking about what it means to build at all. Yeah, so I that, think that's, 
that's quite an astute observation. I hadn't heard it put like that uh, before. And I do think now that I'm kind of moderately distant from a lot of practitioning theatre, but having read and spoken to people, I, I'm actually not convinced there is going to be that much of a of a difference in this build back. But I think it is to that point that you've raised is because you're essentially going to the same builders merchant. So it's not it's completely unsurprising that you're going to get roughly the same type of things coming out. Now, some of the people are somewhat different and maybe they have somewhat different ideas, but they are dealing with approximately the same infrastructure and, and building blocks. So with that sort of analysis, I, I do think that actually that that probably doesn't come across to, to very much change, actually. Well, there's that. And then I kind of go, well, well in, a, in a discourse about building back better, who is talking to whom about yes. what, about what? And it, it seems to me that, that this government um, is kind of saying to the Arts Council, you're talking to us. Um, and in talking to us, we're telling you what we'd like you to do. Now, yes. of course, the DCMS has a contract with the Arts Council. There's nothing new in that. There's nothing Tory specific in that. But I do think that in assessing the landscape, as well as looking at the builders' merchants and the contracts that appertain, it would also be kind of illuminating to ask, well, how does the Arts Council see itself in relationship to those discourses? How does it parlay, on the one hand, its obligations to government through its contractual obligations to the DCM? But on the other, how does it speak to and listen with the sector yeah no I, I think that's really fascinating and in fact opening it up to sort of wider than just theatre arts and arts or creativity in general there is uh, this move by government to have that level of board and trustee sign up to covenant government policy which I, I don't know my history of this is not very good but uh, as far as I know with at least in the last two or three governments of different colors i don't believe that that was such a uh, such a thing that they got um trustees uh to, to to sign up to so i think i think that's quite interesting and then you know one of the things over my own work over the last 10 or 20 years is actually the uh i was going to say subtle but it's not that subtle the enormous influence that board and trustees has on their own organizations and the and the ecosystem i it's i'm mostly unpaid, but it, it's probably the, the lodestone that these organisations kind of work towards. And all of that tricky negotiation, Arts Council, government, policy, funding, money, economic, could you alluded to. Uh, obviously, I think the vast majority of, of people who think independent trustees are the thing are kind of like, oh my gosh, where does that, where does that lead? But it's, it's a thing today. We've had two or three resignations, some high profile already, and uh, it, it, it's going that way. So, yes, interesting that if we go to your thesis, if you want to build back better or differently, you have to take a, a pulse of the landscape, check where it is, and then check who you're speaking to or with. Uh, but I'm not so very sure that this government is uh, very, how to put it, uh, allowing of such a thing to happen. Oh, no, I mean, quite the opposite. I think we can see that, that if you look at the Arts Council guidance, um, it's kind of saying we need to lean more heavily on boards. And I've got, I've got a problem with that because boards should be accountable, it should be responsible. Uh, I remember a rather wonderful publication, probably 30 years old now, Care, Diligence and Skill, that I think came from the Scottish Arts Council, which, which, which was a tremendous little, little pamphlet which basically set out really what it was to be a good, accountable, um, trustee. I've got no problem with that at all. I think good governance is fundamental to help any sector. So absolutely. But, 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 if you're saying to a community of artists, well, you know, it's the boards, these people who are appointed, um, that must shoulder the responsibility. Um, the subtext is because you pesky artists are children and we don't trust you. Yeah, there is. Um, and so we're going to infantilise you by not respecting you. Um, and we're going to twist the Arts Council's arm 
um, to simply say, now you must be our, 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 the bearers of this news and you must enshrine it in your next 10 year plan uh, and make sure that you deliver. And this is not just structural, it then, it then we've seen different high, high level appointments, as you can say, where the government's going, no, we're not renewing you. Um, um, you're from Goldsmiths, we really don't like them, and we really don't like you, uh, and so you're gone, and you're thinking, well, hang on, well, wh where is that in the care, diligence, and skill manual around good governance? Yeah. So there's a kind of profound paradox, it seems to me. On yeah. the one hand, we're being asked to organise ourselves in a more disciplined and accountable way, but we're being met with um, no accountability and the imposition, uh, 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 structural and, and, and uh, yeah. individual. Uh, uh, from a top-down uh, government that, frankly, is is prosecuting a kind of uh, act of cultural vandalism, it seems to me, on our culture, systematically well, I guess at one, the moment. One way someone explained it to me is that they just view too many organisations as the majority of their makeup being, well, let's call it left, or at least not aligned to where government uh, thinking is. Uh, and that's too, too, big a gap, too big a gap for them. I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't even think they care about that. In the same way that they haven't bothered to replace Creative Europe funding, right? Okay. So, you know, I mean, I was called in as a group of people to go in and to 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 talk to uh, some people in government, and basically be asked the question, you know, by civil servants. Well, okay, yeah, the government's looking at different options. This is two or three years ago. Looking at different options about Creative Europe. Can you say, you know, well, why Creative Europe has been a good or bad thing? Uh, if we if we were you know if we were to replace it, what would we replace it with? Um, and so we did their thinking, and we came up with the different ideas, and we advocated as to why something multilateral had a different kind of value. And they all went, well, thank you very much. That's really useful, and, and um, goodbye. Yeah. Um, but I don't even think I don't even I don't the government the government kind of goes, we don't have to care about that, and so we won't. Yeah, I've got increasingly sceptical over. Britain has this almost consultation culture, and I'm now no longer certain what what the consultations actually ever uh, actually ever achieve. Um, uh, well, so, it, yeah, it, but that's it, it, well. It feels like the simple question is: Do you matter? We yeah. don't think you do, but we'd really just like to test that so that, <laughs> so that we don't well, get too much flack. Right. We'll and we'll wheel you all in, and we'll listen, of course, very carefully to what you said, and we'll feed it back up to the powers that be. But they'll blink at it because for us, we give it hours, days, weeks, months of thought because it matters and means something to us. To them, it's a line in a briefing document that is taking up time that could be spent on more important things. And really, all they're doing is going, do I need to blink at this? No. Next. And that's its importance. And I think that, for me, is the reality rather than, oh, well, these are you know, a group of naughty left-wing people who really need re-educating. Sure. Well, maybe riffing on the theme then of visibility, uh, and we talked a little bit about European or, say, playwright versus collaborative theatre. Um, the visibility, I guess, of what we might call uh, disability arts or theatre um, has perhaps also been uh, neglected over the years, but maybe not so in community arts and some other creative practice. So I'd be interested in what you think, and perhaps you could also tell us a little bit about crossing the line. Sure. Um, well, to answer your, your, your kind of wider question first, um, um, I, I did a little piece for The Guardian, I think five or six years ago, in which I tried to set out um, my sense of the landscape at that point, in which I was, I was um, celebratory of what had been achieved in the five years previous to that but also slightly um, warning that that, that, um, that that flowering might not last unless we continued um, to do the tending work. Um, but I also recognise that, that, that there might be a growing appetite for the expertise that this country was able to produce in terms of disabled arts and disabled artists elsewhere. And if I think about well, what's happened in the last five years, What's happened in the last five years is the macroeconomic situation has simply continued to get worse for disabled people. So nothing to do specifically with the arts and culture, excuse me, nothing to do with the arts and culture. Everything to do with, with much more basic human rights in terms of 
of the law in terms of access to support, access um, to uh, be able to, to have paid support uh, to be able to continue working, uh, all those kinds of things that disabled people need in order to even begin their day practicing as artists, let alone anything else, um, have been um, either demolished um, or partly removed or problematized. Uh, we can see now, for example, with just, you know, the last few days, the news on plans for judicial reviews, one of the last bastions uh, uh, that disabled people and um, um, their allies uh, could get hold of um, is itself under significant assault. So whether economically or legally the position of several people in this country has continued to be, I would say, murderously bad. Um, despite that, of course, there's been some fantastic work. Uh, we, we've still got un, unlimited uh, 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 funded um, to make uh, commissions and interventions strategically within the landscape. We've still got great work coming from artists um, and arguably we're, we're kind of well beaten. But in a way that just tells you how poor everybody else is doing. There's a recent report called Time to Act, which On the Move have just published. Um, for those of you who don't know On the Move, let me commend it to you. Uh, it's a kind of European entity that, that, that is really about mobility. Uh, and that includes mobility of disabled people. Um, and together with um, the Europe Beyond Access project funded by Creative Europe, uh, led paradoxically by the British Council, they are, um, uh, they've investigated uh, what the current temperature is in 40 different countries across Europe uh, in relationship to uh, disabled artists and disabled audiences. And it doesn't make for pleasant reading. You won't be surprised to hear. So there's a kind of paradox, which is even though things are worse than they have been here, um, even though things are particularly bad outside the arts of disabled people, there's still some fantastic work being made. Um, and to some degree, we are still the envy of many European countries. I think it's interesting that Germany has just acknowledged Claire Cunningham with a kind of dance award. And I wonder whether Germany, which is a sort of economic superpower when it comes to the arts by comparison to us, um, uh, whether Germany is now starting to get disability in a way that it's taken them a while and that that might be an interesting development. I mean, do you ascribe, we'll come to crossing the line, do you ascribe then at all to uh, one of the theories that actually adversity or oppression sparks this kind of creative uh, resistance uh, at all? Or, I mean, I, th I, I have a little bit of credence to it, but I feel very <laughs> worried by it because it's, yeah, it's yeah, also like, yeah. let's just treat you extremely badly yeah, yeah, because exactly. then you no, make no. work, which it's, is like it's, obviously it's, seems it's, wrong, right? So it's, it's the whole kind of romantic, you know, the dignity of labor thing. Yeah. And, and, you, and you kind of go, um, um, yes, of course, there's always an element within everybody whereby if someone says, well, you can't do that, um, we'll turn around and go, well, fuck you, I'm going to anyway. And you go, nothing wrong with that, perfectly healthy, but that's not specific to disabled people. It's, it's yeah. about everybody. What I would say is that disabled people have, have been innovating since day one because they have to encounter a world that is not designed for them and on the whole not prepared or even aware that it might, might usefully make some adaptations to comfortably accommodate them participating in the life of society. Um, they've had to innovate their way out of that, um, um, either noisily or quietly or seamlessly or individually or collectively forever. And so they're natural innovators. So if you, what we should be doing is placing them in the centre of the crucible. So if you're talking about, well, what would you want to do in terms of build back better? Um, I'd abandon the building merchants entirely. And I kind of go, diversity is the crucible of future culture and society. So let us be gathering ourselves and let's begin with them because they're going to innovate in ways that us in the mainstream don't even imagine, let alone see. Now, that might be equally romantic, but, you know, we're due a little bit of time <laughs> to just test that one, it seems to me. Yeah, let's give it at least one shot at, yeah. at some point. Yeah. Uh, and so what have you learned from crossing the line maybe tell us a little bit of, uh, about it and the possibilities that it's opened up sure so crossing line is now a partnership 
uh, currently of six European theatre companies who all make professional touring theatre with learning disabled and autistic artists. Uh, the partnership is Mind the Gap in Bradford in the UK, Mom's Theater in Malmo in Sweden, Compagnie de Loiseau Mouche in Roubaix in France, Blue Teapot in Galway in Ireland, Theatre 21 in Warsaw in Poland, and Theatre Babel in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and since 2014, we've been working on three projects funded either by Creative Europe or Erasmus Plus, in other words, all European Union funding. And what have we learned? Well, I think we've learned quite a lot, partly because um, two of those projects were with the Brits, the French and the Swedes, who were the original three partners. We've subsequently grown to six and we hope to grow again in the future. Um, and they've all been working for between 30 and 40 years, but they've all grown up um, almost as autodidact companies. They had no peers. They kind of pioneered the way. Obviously, you've got hijinks in Wales as a sort of analogue of, of, of Mind the Gap in, in the UK, but certainly nothing like uh, at Monstail and all Los English in France or Sweden. And so um, they'd never really had an opportunity to come together and look at somebody like them over a sustained period of time, either to exchange artists or to interrogate the company's culture, structures, practices. Um, and that's been incredibly illuminating. And incredibly useful, I think, um, both for the companies and for me as the project dramaturg, kind of looking on and looking in. Um, and, you know, as someone that, that, that also has a, a kind of foot in the cultural policy camp, which I work on at Goldsmiths, um, it's always been important to me to try to understand the wider cultural context in which things do and don't happen. And so, not surprisingly, um, the differences between how things happen in England, France and Sweden are enormous. Um, so even though we're all part of Europe and even though we're all part of wealthy Northwest Europe, there are still huge differences that take some time to negotiate and figure out. Um, the work has been fantastic in its difference. Um, um, uh, so the French will not have an artistic lead in their company. And they will they will be a producing house with with wonderful facilities, a company of twenty three, but their whole way of doing things is they get guest directors in, and every show is different, and so the audience never knows what to expect, and that's exactly as they think it should be. Um, because of laicity, uh, 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 translated probably rather badly as secularism, um, they don't have the same attitude or discourse around disability as we do in this country. And so much of, of, of the disability arts landscape has come out of a kind of political movement over the last 40, 50 years in this country. That's not the same in France at all. In some ways, they've kind of jumped over all that and gone absolutely towards a mainstream where disability isn't part of the dominant aspect of their discourse. It's all about audiences. It's all about the quality of the work and the variety of work. So that's been incredibly useful and, and, and illuminating for me. Um, uh, then again, opening things up to, to, to um, particularly Poland. And we, we tried to, to extend an invitation to uh, colleagues in Serbia, but actually they've become part of that Europe Beyond Access uh, partnership and project, which is great, which means that they're moving forward. But, but, but very, very interesting to look at how things happen outside wealthy Northwest Europe as well, where they don't have anything like the same level of infrastructure support, but are nonetheless making some very interesting work, both Per Arts in Novi Sad and Tiesa 21 in Warsaw, for example. Um, uh, the, the Crossing the Line uh, partnership, as well as being about exchanging artists and learning more about other companies' systems and structures, um, also comes together to present work at festivals. And um, we began this with um, the first festival in Roubaix in 2017, which went tremendously well. And we had hoped to follow that up with a second festival in May last year in Galway as part of that city's European capital of culture. But of course, um, despite enormous preparations and extensive work by our colleagues at Blue Tupac, you know, six weeks before opening the festival, we had to stop everything. Um, and so we haven't been able to do it and we won't be able to do it because 
the Galway European Capital Culture extended for a further three months into the first quarter of this year, but has gently um, wound up its windows and, and kind of pulled in its horns. And so we will have to think again, once we're able to get back to face-to-face -face working, well, what will be the next incarnation and manifestation of our work? Instead, we're working- Something in the Florence. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 certainly we need Italian partners. And, and, yeah. and I have been down, not to Florence, but to Lecce, uh, uh, to see the rather wonderful work of Fattoria Campania, um, uh, who, who, did, who did a lovely Uruguay. Um, but marvellously, I managed to sneak away last October during the pandemic, fly to Italy and get to watch and meet them, which was one of the highlights of my working year. Um, so I'm hopeful that there's an Italian conversation to be had. I don't know where it will be. We'll, we, we will we'll do something online as part of a kind of digital programme later this year, just as a way of saying we're really sorry we couldn't bring you all to Gaulle. Um Please don't forget about us. We're still here. We're still working. Um, here's some examples of our work. Let's be keeping in touch. But the commitment, I think, more widely, um, is very much to continue to grow that work and to grow the platform for it and the profile of it. So, yeah, that's pretty exciting bunch of, uh, of things. Maybe we'll wind up with um, two or three sort of final questions. There's so much still to cover, actually, but one would be that you lecture at Goldsmiths, and I'd be interesting to know what being a kind of a teacher lecturer, sort of, I guess, somewhat academic has also brought to your work or your understanding of the world. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm you know, I, I have a kind of quarter of a job at Goldsmiths. Um, and in that sense, I'm a quarter of an academic. Oh. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, um, not really. Just not really, your left arm. Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, barely my left arm on a good day. Um, so, so I would say that, 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 um, that I lack both the knowledge and the credentials and the expertise um, to be anything more than a part-time academic, but also chiefly the design, because I enjoy all the other things I do outside the academy. And, that's, and they do too, and that's why I'm in the department in the way that I am, because they value the fact that I'm working in all the other ways that I am, and that that will inform um, not just the presentations that I can give about that work, but perhaps the way I'm able to engage with students. I think particularly the fact that, that, that much of my work is international because so many students are international uh, uh, in the department and particularly on the programmes on which I work, which are all master's programmes. Um, in terms of teaching, well, um, uh, I did a year as a school teacher uh, in 1983-4 when I immediately after leaving university um, um, uh, and, and that was my formal experience of, of, of teaching. It was kind of factors in a fire in that I learned far more in that year, of course, uh, being a school teacher for a year than I had in the previous three at university. Um, so I had a sort of little mini introductory crash course to what teaching was per se. But I guess if you're functioning as a dramaturg and you're working in the sector in the ways that I do, um, in a way, you're constantly operating sort of in, in, in a mode that is not quite teaching, but it's similar in that you've got to you've got to prepare your lesson and then be prepared to abandon it yeah. in, in, in favour of something better that presents itself in the moment. And you've got to hopefully develop the skills and practices to know whether you need to retrieve a bit of your lesson plan, um, in the ensuing improvised chaos that you confront or not. Um, they're not quite the same thing, but I think there's a link. What I think I've, I've learned is, is that, uh, in a way, I see, I see my Goldsmith work in several ways, but in some ways, I see it as paid professional development for me. I see it as a way of, of, of undergirding all my freelance work, because I'm paid to encounter um, um, almost invariably younger, let us say, usually considerably the, the main minds um, across all subject areas because in working in arts administration, cultural policy, arts, uh, arts administration, cultural relations, cultural diplomacy, we have students from all over the world whose backgrounds are in every art subject imaginable, museums, galleries or none. 
And they are all writing about things that are as different as you could imagine. So I'm getting a continual feed of their thoughts, their ideas, their questions, their challenges, their investigations, that sometimes occasionally intersect and overlap with my areas of specialism, but fundamentally don't. And so I'm getting enormous generalist input from all those younger minds, um, which enables me to start making different kinds of connections in my own head, asking different kinds of questions in my own head. If one of the functions of the dramaturg is to try to ask timely, salient, challenging, productive questions of a process, of a group of people, to be catalytic and to add value. It seems to me that there is a relationship between some of my work at Goldsmiths as contributing and supporting to them. And of course, yes, I have responsibilities, and so it's not simply paying professional development. Sure. I, w I wouldn't want people thinking that. that what do you think is there. maybe most misunderstood about dramaturgy or maybe your practice of 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 being a dramaturg well i think I, hopefully the, the 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 word is has started to, to to gain a little bit more um widespread engagement um uh, and we've moved beyond the sort of skepticism of of, of the new or the idea that, that, that the officer class is somehow being by being challenged by these these upstart enlisted men, and what's going on? Uh, of course, they're largely enlisted women, so I won't <laughs> pursue that analogy any further. But you get the idea. It's a different kind of power and energy, one that perhaps shapes us, transforms. It's not designed to overpower or to overcome or to supply. Now, often the dramaturgical function is delivered perfectly well by the extant team in the room. And there is no need for any kind of dramaturg per se, because the directors, playwrights, actors, anybody else in the mix is all doing that beautifully. But sometimes, particularly if you're working in very different contexts or with very different audiences or in very different ways, sometimes having someone who's got that focus on the catalytic, a little bit like my work with the six companies, my work isn't necessarily about getting the work on stage or even looking at it in script form. It's about being the person that's paying specific and focused attention to, in fact, the partnership, the programme, the collaboration, the work, that, without having to worry about all the other aspects of what a director or, or a company might have to think about. And so that concentration on the catalytic seems to me to be the specific function of the dramaturg where they can add value. Very clear. Not, not always. Yeah. And what do you think you learned from your work with Ambitious about autism? So one tiny other pivot before we come into the home stretch. Sure. So Ambitious about autism is, is national charity for children and young people with autism uh, um, uh, or autistic people, depending on how you like to formulate that. And um, the organisation grew out of Treehouse, which was a school um, at which my son went from the ages of four to twelve. Um, and that was my connection into the organisation. But being ambitious about autism, they grew um, from one school to now three and a couple of colleges, um, a research and advocacy facility, a, a wider community facility. Um, because all of those things contribute to, hopefully, improving the quality of autistic people's lives and certainly their education. Um, they've realised that if you are going to do that, you've also got to think about employment and employability. I learned a great deal from my time of, of being a trustee with them for seven years, um, partly because I hadn't, um, I hadn't worked for an organisation at that scale. Uh, either as an employee or um, in a governance role. You know, I've been vice chair of the Playwright Studio Scotland or vice chair of ATC, which is fantastic. But you know, well, no. you've got, you've got, you've got. It's a much larger organisation, uh, and so you're having, you're having, you're having the same conversations, but you're having slightly different conversations too. Um, I think I learned, I, I learned more about. Potentially, my, my, what I could bring, 
because I wasn't in the same kind of arts milieu. And so I could, I could go, well, I can bring some sort of authentic experience as the parent of an autistic boy. Um, I'm not going to try to speak on behalf of other parents because we don't agree. And there's no point in pretending that we would. Where I think there might be common good, I might advocate in a certain area. But fundamentally, I'm, I'm going to try and see what the bigger picture of the organisation is, is and bring me and my, my sensibilities and what I know from the areas that I have worked in and what I have learned to bear to that as part of the wider team. And so I was able to, in a sense, extrapolate the basic experience that I've learned from the Back to Care, Diligence and Skill, that rather wonderful Scottish Arts Council pub slim publication of 30 years ago, um, simply to a wider organisation with a different ecology. Um, um, uh, I learned, I hope, to operate in a milieu that wasn't full of people like me. And so I, 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 I had to find a way to engage with people whose backgrounds may be politically very different from me. Fascinating. Um, and I also had to learn, you know, so I, I was trustee from 2006 to 2013. So we, we moved from a Labour administration to a Conservative administration. And, and, and that brought very, very specific challenges and opportunities, actually. Um, and so looking at that was incredibly useful for me because I was able to, to A, look at things and B, use lenses that, that were not afforded to me within the art sector. So I was very grateful for that. Um, uh, I learned a great deal from the other people who were there. I learned a great deal um, about the culture of organisations. I learned a great deal about about autism and just how different people see it and different people think about it. Um, I was very pleased to be involved with them in, in certain areas of their work. And, uh, uh, and so they began a, a programme of, of moving beyond um, focusing on the schooling of, of autistic young people with, with quite considerable needs um, to also including youth voice. Yeah. And so working and employment with, and all of these other areas. Indeed. And, 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 and you know, I, I remember going to a presentation from the State Department, US State Department, that, 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 that Ambitious facilitated, which was tremendously useful in terms of, of a really, really good history of all the interventions and changes and successes within the American education system since America started paying attention to autistic people in their education in the 70s. And it was a series of fabulous kind of graphs that were fundable to me, you know, yeah. upward diagonals in terms of all the milestones, all the progress, all the outcomes, all the increases and advances in educational offer and attainment uh, uh, to and for autistic people in the United States in the 45 year period. But there was one slide that she showed that struck me, and that was around employment. And that was a horizontal line. Mm. And I've never had that quite so starkly presented yeah. to me before that it flatlines yeah. completely. And so it, it, it caused me to rethink the way in which I thought about the education of young people as not starting at two, let alone five, but actually starting at 25 and kind of going, but then you've got to reverse engineer. You've got to start at 25 and reverse engineer it back to two. And that's the way you've got to fundamentally think about it and construct it and work towards it. Because there is absolutely no point in all those fabulous graphs with all those wonderful diagonals, mm. rising diagonals, if in the end they fall off a cliff mm. because the employability, when they stop being quote unquote educated, flatlines. Yeah, I, ha I hadn't seen it as a, uh, as a flat line. It doesn't surprise me. Um, so, yeah. I mean, and, and it is interesting because even a very, in fact, uh, more so a very, say, market orientated government of some stripe would actually think, well, at 25 or 30 or 40, we want these, to use their language, people to be productive and so not a net cost to society. And so you would actually thought that via everything in just in this, you know, if you think of a government entity as this sort of selfish thing, if they're trying to balance these things, that that's where they would head to because then they would think, oh, all of this is an investment because suddenly they're not a cost on our books, right? But obviously that's not how we think of it, but it's how um, 
you know, the, these entities could do. So it's kind of almost remarkable that we haven't got to that place. But actually, strangely, I could see that maybe we will do because it, it, it makes sense to that um, to that market machine. It could make sense under that framework, as well as actually the, you know, any human framework that you that you'd want to do. It's a it's a strange way where they could marry. Well, I think I, I, I think that you've hit the nail gloriously on the head, Ben. It, it, it's that that idea about how do we how do we characterise those two pictures? How do we characterise those two lines and the fact that they are at profoundly different angles? And in a way, they're two different worlds and perceived as two different worlds. But of course, they're not. Yeah. They're, they're, they're <laughs> the same world because it's the same person stepping stepping yeah. across the threshold at twenty something. So they're not different worlds at all. But, but, but how to reconcile the two worlds um, seems to me to be about, can we, on the one hand, value human capital for life that isn't just saying, let's keep finding ways to invest in them in the first 25 years, and then let's please God not have to do any more investing for the next 50. Yeah. And that that's not a way to do anything with anybody, ever. Yeah, exactly. I went we're in agreement there. Okay, final two questions, because I've taken up so much of your time. Uh, so it is, uh, we can take them and all I'll do again is, what does a productive day look like for you? I think people find this very interesting to sort of say, you know, what works or what doesn't. It's quite individual. And last one would be any advice you have for creatives or artists, I guess, particularly young creatives or artists, or maybe uh, sure. disabled ones too, but generally yeah. thoughts yeah. over your long uh, career. So what does productive day look like? Um, it never looks like the day before. Right. It never, it never looks the same. Um, um, I think that I think that that that, and there's no romance in that because because it, it it's it's in avoiding the tyranny of, of repetition. I think Beckett said, uh, uh, um, "Habit is the ballast that chains the dog to its vomit." Um, and you can kind of go, "Yeah, God forbid, I should be sat in front of my desk doing this day in day out." Um, uh, uh, but, of course, um, um, if you're not going to do that, you've got to invent every day anew. Uh, and, and, and what I would say is, is a successful day um, might be a very productive 40 minutes. It's unlike, uh, sometimes it's 10 hours of battery because you just have to do that. You have to get something done on a deadline and you have to do it and you cannot either distract yourself or delegate it um, or force somebody else to do it. You just have to do it. And so occasionally there are those days and you kind of slide off the chair at the end of them completely exhausted into bed and you're not even aware that it's been productive. You're just grateful that you can stop. But on the whole, it's not that. It's the 40 minutes. It's looking back and going, what have I done today? And it's not a great big long list of things. It's actually, yeah, that was a really rich 40 minutes. And sometimes it's just because I had a thought that I hadn't had before that unlocked something for me and enabled me to move something forward that was joyous because I felt like I didn't know I was going to get there. I didn't know that was, that was coming and that was really nice. Sometimes it's I put my hand on that person's shoulder and I know that that made a difference. And that's enough. That that's fine. Um, sometimes sometimes it might be, um, it might be just stopping in the street and having a conversation with a neighbour. Um, I, I I'm not one of these people that has kind of you know five year plans and oh, kind yeah. of and kind of three hour uh, writing day. No 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 no. Yeah. I, I I'm just not I'm just not like that. I I I, I so so I I don't do eight hour days usually. There are exceptions, um, but there's seldom a day that I don't work. So it's something, yes. Because those are the rhythms. It's a, an every day of something. It is. Occasionally there'll it be a Saturday where I don't do anything. But on the whole, I kind of like, I dip in and out. You know, I like a lot of my work. And so it's not like, well, why are you working? It's yeah. like, well, I like it. Like what I, is, there's that aphorism, find a job you love and never work. Yeah, something like that. I mean, it, and it isn't always like that at all. But, but on good days, it yeah. is. So that was, right. that was that one. That was Adv advice for, young, one. Advice yeah, for, advice young for creatives, young creatives um, maybe, but, um, I, or, but kind of like you said, that's actually, and I've had this now, is uh, young creators is useful, but actually older creators or just creatives 
generally yeah. I, I end up talking about actually you can restart at 40 50 60 i mean we sh- we sh- we should the kind of statistics suggest that today we should be living well into our 80s if yeah. not untoward happens so yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. Well, look, I, I, anyway, I, I, I'd, I'd be wrong if I if I if I characterize that bit of it anything right. other than this. I'm 60 next year and I kind of go. So, so I vacillate between, on the one hand, passionately believing that my best work is ahead of me. Yes. Uh, 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 and at the same time going, oh, fuck, another 20 years of this. Surely not. Right. And, and, and uh, you know. My, in a way, my task is to try and creatively inhabit the space in between. The advice I would give to anybody is ask. Ask. And it sounds really simple, but it's really hard. It's really hard and it's a skill. It's a life skill that, that people have to keep working on. But largely, I do things, uh, not always, but largely I do things because somebody asks me. So never stop questioning? Is that ask as in ask for a mentor, ask for help, ask to do things? Or is it also ask as in unpick the curiosity of why something is, how it could be, or, or is it both? I guess oh, it's all, the whole package. All, all of that and more. I mean, it seems to me that, that, that mostly what we can do in our allocated four score years um, is to try and ask slightly better questions. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if did you want to end on any future upcoming uh, project or, or thought uh, for us at all? I think you kind of ended it by saying ask. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I'm, I mean, I think I think that um, um, uh, trying to find the pleasure in asking rather than the fear. Right. Uh, um, and I think that may just be something that 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 is a benefit of being sixty and not twenty. Because um, I just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. if you don't like me, if you think I'm an idiot, that's fine. You could well be wrong. Yeah. But let me try and focus on asking things of myself, asking things of others. Can I ask in a better way? Can I question in a better way? Um, that may seem like a modest ambition, but I think it's it's it, that, that's that's probably a good place for me to be. Right. But to ask you, Ben, is there anything oh. that, that anything that you would want to say to say um, to me? No, and more. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the whole conversation. I think that was very uh, that was very rich, and I look forward to hearing your sort of niche uh, adventure episode uh, from Florence. So we should definitely uh, speak again. And I, I kind of hope that maybe we might be able to get at least one uh, in person meeting before. September. But if not, I'm sure we will continue these conversations uh, over the years. Uh, and I, I, hope to I, I, look, I, look, I look forward to them. Um, um, uh, um, our listeners, um, uh, I hope, would, 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 would like to know that one of our nicest conversations was in New York. And so yes. there is, there is a where good, we reconnected after. It was where we reconnected Maybe after five or years. ten years or That's something right. like that. And, and so there is a long and noble tradition of these conversations taking place in other parts. I hope you will join us uh, on future fence meetings when your circumstances are. Yes. I'm, I'm that hoping will be an, another opportunity open as well. up at some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and thank you so much for, for asking me uh, and for facilitating this conversation. No, that would be great. Um, and so. You'll have uh, links to Jonathan's website and all of that on uh, on the blog. And that just leads me to thank uh, Jonathan once again for being Dramaturg Extraordinaire. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.